So I was actually going to mostly read from the textbook since because this thing didn't work and I had already read the chapter like twice, though I probably haven't gotten most of the, like this one part, but I'm totally blanked out. But if you don't mind, I'll look through the textbook and, and discuss it. So I, because I, you know, I actually read this more than I actually looked at the RMD, which is kind of opposite of what I always do, but this time it was the opposite. Of yeah, no worries. Uh, okay, so yeah, you know, after we talked last time, I went back and I read through this and uh, gosh, it was so interesting, especially that whole simulation part. Like I was just, I had just posted that on Slack, um, you know, the way they, how regression to the mean can confuse people about causal inference demon demonstration using fake data. My God, that was just so interesting. Like I really, really enjoyed reading that. Yeah, that that it's really cool. Um, although it wasn't until I saw the Slack that I remembered what you, what was going on there because I had to. You had like, already read. Yeah, I guess you you had already read through that for your presentation last week. So. Yeah. I, um, I did. Sorry. Yeah, I did, but like to be honest, is it was nice seeing a different perspective on it because I didn't. Um, I kind of got it, and it's like. This is quite, you know, I, I remember last week saying, oh, this is quite difficult to understand. I don't really quite follow this properly. And it was that bit because it's kind of like, oh, so you've got this whole kind of like everything's kind of like moved toward the mean yes. kind of situation. But actually what you have to take account of is the paradox, which is that actually it's a prediction and the, the variance in... The, predict, like the variance in the mean of the prediction is what stops you from actually regressing to the mean in actuality. Correct. So the, That's correct. So the more you regress to the mean, the less variance in your, in your data, but um, because the model has its own variance, they, they are supposed to balance themselves out. So like mm -hmm. the more you regress to the mean, you have less variance, but your model is making all these predictions and that accounts for the variation that you reduce here. So between the two of them. So I guess that's where you have the, um, so it's interesting because if you look at the way they've run their simulation, the true ability on page 89 is the mean is actually 50 and then the standard deviation is 10. But when they generate the noise, the noise mm. is always with mean zero, but with uh, a standard deviation. So I, I, was, I was wondering why, why it is that when you're doing um, like the real sample, you actually do it with the mean. But then when you have, uh, when you have the error term, why, why is it from a mean zero? Like, is that, is that standard practice? Is that how it's always done? Your noise one and noise two? Um, I don't know, but I suspect the reason why they do that is because um, otherwise you would be artificially adding on an additional number to, because what you're looking to do is just add variation. Yeah. Um, and you, you just want variation Think of it, uh, do, do you know about time series? No. Uh, okay. Um, uh, do you know what, maybe a better way of doing it is this. So if I, um, if you think about it this way, if you add a zero, if you've got zero for your mean, for your, um, for your variance, when you add it to, um, when you're adding it to a number that already exists. Correct. Yeah. Then what happens is you're then because you're just looking at the distribution from the zero point you just add or take that away from the uh the number that already exists whereas okay. if you added any number in there you'd be mm -hmm. adding more variance on top so if you had a constant it'd just be that's one a good point and or two or three but if you had um a number that's allowed to vary then you'd be adding variance on variance that's correct. So you, the variance, the variance is added to both the intercept and all the coefficients, or is it only added to the it's interceptor? Just, so the so when you look at the uh, true ability number, yes, that number is one thousand times. Um, that was uh, that is one thousand numbers made up yeah. with a mean of fifty and a standard deviation of ten. Now the noise is then added on top in the other uh, columns, and okay. that is a mean of zero Correct. and a variance of ten, and it also is thousand is a thousand times. 
that's just added on top. So if you added a number in the middle, that would yeah. just add a one, two, three, four, whatever number it is on yeah. top of the 50, which on is the that, mean already, number. Yeah. yeah. But you're not looking at that, you're just looking at the noise. Yeah. So yeah, that's why you would do that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, then the other thing is, um, so the the standard error for the intercept and the coefficients is, is its own. And then you also get a sigma um, for the entire model, correct? So that's the one which is the auxiliary parameters. The, the, the sigma line, that's your standard deviation. Oh, yeah. So... Th that's, that, right. that's, that's what it discusses in this one, right? So yeah. let's have a quick look at that. So that's actually um, your standard deviation, or in other words, the that would contribute to the error term, correct? Um, I believe so. I'm not really quite sure how to apply that bit, to be honest. Well, because if you look at um, if you look at the example on here. Let me yeah, let's take a look at example on page 87. Uh, so there, if you look at it, you see how, um, actually maybe it was not there. You know what, actually I, I take that back. I think it's in the current chapter. So let's just jump right there. I think we'll see this there. So it's okay if we can't, I'm sorry, this is my, my apologies because I didn't have my act together. So uh, that's why the thing didn't knit. I'll, I'll take a look at it and see what's going on. But anyway, you have a textbook and so do I. So let's just read from them. Uh, oh, I've, got the, I've got the document knitted if you want. Oh, you do have it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't know. It, do you want me to send you the markdown file or should I just like yeah, show it on my screen? Yeah, just go ahead and share it. it. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I Since I haven't even seen that, I'm probably just going to go off of the textbook, but it would be nice to have that just for the figures. Oh, what happened there? Uh, one sec. Cancel that. Oh, here we go. All right. Please ignore the large amount of tabs. Oh, no. Is yours a Mac? <laughs> uh, no, it's a Windows computer. Oh, it's a Windows. Okay. I don't know what, um, I don't understand what the big thing is about Macs, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know what? I couldn't agree more with you, but I know the ones who are Macs, they are like uh, Mac users. Are I've got one, but if, when it comes to data analytics, I don't see the advantage. Um, uh, like, I think it's great U UI and it's really easy to use, but I, but I think that it's harder to use in many cases because most systems are designed for Windows first. Yes, most systems are. I mean, I think it's really great for things like, uh, for like, you know, illustration and for, you know, like graphics. Yeah, you're right. I think mm. it, it really is superior there, but... You know, something like a Surface Pro or, a, or an Apple tablet would suffice there. You know what I mean? If that's your thing. But OK, um, let's see. All right. Predicting presidential vote share from the economy. OK, so I'm just going to start. And, and whenever it pulls up, that's cool. Oh, so before we go very far, can you just explain? Maybe you know this off the top. But you know the fourth line? Yeah, and it's got the formula. Yes. It's got yi equals a plus bxi yes. plus error to date. And error to date is uh, yi, xi, yi, yi, and then i equals one dot 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 n. Do you know what that means? Well, because you could have... Uh... Well, oh, you know, is that just the expl explained variance between X and Y? Yes. And so, then the one means that is scaled to between zero and one. No, I think it's just so if you have 20 data points and for each value of X, you have a Y, correct? So if you are going to plot each value of X and Y and, and, you, have a, and you, you, you have the outcome variable for each one of those, then you'll, in theory, you'll have 20, 20 different equations. Uh, equations or y extending from 1 through 20, assuming you have 20 um, mm. such data points. So uh, I believe that that's what that's representing. Oh, okay. 
because each of them, each one of those points are probably going to deviate from your, your standard, I mean, your, your slope line or your mean line, right? So I think that that's where your error term comes in with each one of those points. But that's a really good, good thing that you brought that up because now it's, it's a really visual picture to be able to see that. Because each one of those terms would actually have an error. And so when you create your regression model, it's applying the, what is that? So if you, okay, here, that's a really good. Error, it, error is sigma, isn't it? So, error, you know, you know sigma. when you look at the model, the, the, the sigma is basically saying how much, um, how much potential error is in the model. Yes, that's exactly correct. That is your error. Oh, no, no. it's the standard deviation. It's actually not the error. It's the standard error for your coefficients, but for the model, it's your standard deviation. That sigma is your standard deviation. Wait, say what? <laughs> so, so when you report, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the coefficients that you get back from a model, um, you get back um, the error term on your coefficients. But on your model itself, it gives you the standard deviation. Is that not right? Okay. Um. Yeah, the coefficients give you the um, get the, the standard, standard, error, the standard right? deviation. The 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 deviation for those uh, coefficients. Okay, so that's not the standard error either. I wonder why they keep saying standard error because that's a little bit confusing. But it seems to be this, uh, looking at page 97, it seems to be like, we can actually look at this anyway on this, uh, on this task because it will show us here. So um, if we just go through this quickly. So yeah, okay, yeah, sounds good. Okay, all right, sounds good. So let's start with this data set, it's called Hibs. So they read the data and you have growth on the, um, you have, uh, okay, so it's coded as vote and then the, and the income, which is growth. And your poppy and your uh, your work is on the y axis and your growth is on the on the x axis. Basically, okay. the economy follows uh, vote voting really. Exactly, exactly. So if you jump to figure seven point two, you can see that you have that equation y is equal to forty six point three plus three times x. Okay, so now relating this to what I saw in the previous chapter where it says that, um, you know, on page 86, you know where it says the equation y is equal to 30 plus 0 0.54 times x describes a line with intercept 30 and a slope 0 0.54. The intercept slope formula is an easy way to visualize a line, but it can have problems. The line slope of 0 0.54 is clearly interpretable in any case. Adding an inch to mother's height corresponds to an increase of 0 0.54 inches in the daughter's height, but the intercept of 30 is hard to understand. I guess this is the intercept slope way of de depicting things. So a different way to show the regression line is to center it not at zero, but at the mean of the data. And there you would actually show uh, your equation as 63.9, which is actually the mean of the mother's height, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the 0 0.54 and you, um, no, I'm sorry, 63.9, I think is your, um, is the daughter, is, is the daughter's height, actually, excuse me. The mean height is 62.5. So your, the daughter's height would be 63.9 plus uh, whatever, the mother's height is and however much the mother deviates from the average, which is 62.5 of mother height of all the mother's heights and her, the daughter's height would be half of that difference. Correct. And I believe 63.9 there is going to be the mean of the daughter's height, presumably. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And the reason I jumped back to that is because I wanted to apply that to page 94 in the current chapter. So the equation y is equal to 30 plus 0 0.54. So you see that the way it's written there, right, um, August? So that 63.9 is nothing but your average daughter's height, is average height of daughters. Yeah. Correct? 
yeah, it's just, it, <clears throat> it's a starting point at the mean the mean of the dish of the formula. So for the prediction. Oh, is that yeah? Yeah, because you know when you see the uh, you see that scatter plot on. Ah, uh, yeah. So yeah, you see that's sixteen point nine. Correct. So that is yeah. the average daughter's height on the y-axis, and the average mother's height is sixty-two point five on the x-axis. Yeah. So it starts is that how it always is that you start with a mean i mean if you didn't think of it as a slope intercept thing and you actually had to represent it like this is this how it would really be in real life that you would have the mean on the y or the outcome and then you'd have the mean on the x and and then you would subtract that off of each value of your um x value to get the corresponding y so that's how it works then right it's mean of your y plus the slope slope if, between x and if y you're, if you're looking for the middle part of the coefficient the middle part of your x value will predict the middle part of your y value um but that that's really dependent on really the model because there are cases where the model can be continuous and go on and on. And on. Um, so what is the middle could probably be a bit more kind of. Ah, okay, yeah. But conceptually, that's how the intercept slope thing translates. It's basically the midpoint of here plus the midpoint of this. And then you would um, you would zero center the uh, thing. Yeah, before you get to prediction, uh, when you're basing it on the actual data driven part of it, yeah. the middle of your distribution should predict the middle of the y distribution. But it does more than just the middle, right? Because here you can literally go off of all the values on your x and predict yeah, the entire it's, range it's of y. The, it's the variance from that that is given to you by the, um, gr by the uh, coefficient. So the y-intercept. Oh, it's the variance from the mean that is given to you by the coefficient is what you're saying. Yes. So if you, so, so the reason why you might want to start a, a, a regression at a plus number that is way higher than zero is because it doesn't make sense to look at it at zero. So, but the slope of the intercept tells you, well, the starting point for half of cases is 46.17. Why do you say half the cases though? Because that's, uh, that, that's where you find the middle value. So in in half of elections, um, in half of elections, the incumbents, the incumbent wow. party's candidate receives forty six point one seven percent of the vote. So, so, but if the economic growth is increased by one percent, then the vote share increases by three point zero six percent, and if it declines by one percent. That it decreases by uh, by three point zero six one percent. So the forty six point three is when you don't have an X. Uh... Just think of it as this way: you start off at forty six point three, yeah, and that depending on how much growth you have in your economy, uh, then you can increase uh, the coefficient. But if your economy uh, if, if your movement is negative, then your growth will be negative. Now, that doesn't tell you about how you win the vote, because in order to win the vote, you need something like the popular vote. You need over 50% of the vote. So you would need to get at least 1% in terms of growth yeah. in order to win an election in most years, apart from the bit in the top left corner. Could it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's okay. All right, so let me go to page 95, okay? So we know now that the standard deviation of the model is 3.9. We know that the intercept is 46.3 and we know the growth is three. Okay, so if you have to use y is equal to a plus bx, we would actually say that it's 46 plus three. Uh, one second, sorry, I made a mistake. Um, that 46.17 refers to um, in this particular case, when the x-axis is zero. When it's zero. So yeah. I was getting confused with the heights thing because they moved the axis around. 
No problem. Yeah, in this case, it's when your x is zero. It's 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 the it is the uh, it is the growth when your um, when the growth. I'm sorry. It is your vote share when your growth is actually zero. So in other words, yeah. when the let's say the president has done nothing good or bad, he or she would win 46.3 percent of the votes. So like which, that's yeah. Which in this case is Nixon versus Kennedy. Wow, that was close. Is that the one it is, though? Is, is that what they plotted here in 7.2? Well, it appears to be that in 7.2, which is um, I think basically it's all zero... of the data in 7.1, though, isn't it? Sorry? It's all of the points from 7.1, though, which is yes. all of those elections. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. The one at zero is 2008, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which That's is better. McCain versus Obama. Oh, I got it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. All right, sounds good. Okay, so August, I'm going to jump on to page 95. At yeah, X sure. is equal to zero, the incumbent party's candidate is predicted to receive 46.3. That, that's just what we said. Each percentage growth of economic, um, point of economic growth uh, corresponds to an expected vote share that is three, three percentage points higher than your intercept when there is none. So basically, if um, economic growth, yeah, so when each point increase in percentage growth, you would have three percentage points increase in your, uh, in your vote share. Okay, so that makes sense. The standard, so see how here they call it standard errors? Mm -hmm. That's what made me wonder if you're actually looking at standard errors, but actually it's a, it's a standard deviation, right? So uh, we don't usually care about the standard error on the intercept, but the standard error on the slope is a measure of the uncertainty in this estimate. In this case, the standard error is 0 0.7. So this is what led me to believe that we are looking at standard error for the coefficients, but standard deviation for the entire model. Uh, but uh, I was uh, if you remember, Michael said before in the past that standard uh, standard error um, is basically the uh, kind of aggregated version of the standard deviation, but it's for the coefficient. So, but, so when you've got a mean for the coefficient, you use a standard error. But when you're looking at the uh, population parameter, which is the sigma value, that tells you the overall kind of like uh, standard deviation. I think. So the level of the coefficients, we would typically use a standard error, but the others would be um, the standard uh, Yeah, standard. when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about the coefficients, you use standard error, and when you're talking about the population parameters, you look about standard deviation. Uh, that's that's the impression I'm getting. Got it. Okay, okay, makes sense. So in this case, the standard error is 0 0.7. So the data are roughly consistent with the slope in the range of, okay, so it's plus or minus the standard error, obviously, because mm -hmm. that's how your slope is, plus or minus that. And the 95% confidence interval is your coefficient plus or minus two times your standard error. And that makes sense because you're covering the 95% range. And that's how you get your um, your confidence interval 1.6 and 4.4. So that includes the 3.0. So you know that the true value is encompassed um, in that range. So the interval is well separated from zero. And so uh, indicating that if the data had been generated from a model whose true slope was zero. So if the true slope is zero, that means you're, there is no variation at all because it's... Um, yes. Right? Yeah. It um, means there's no... It means there's no growth or decline. There's it means no growth. Yeah. That, yeah. Effectively, okay. if you have a straight line, slope, there's no relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. It tells you something about the data you have, which it neither predicts nor. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so you, you're not explaining enough of the information. But using your model or your whatever. Metric. Yeah. Or alternatively, the noise is just mean. The data is meaningless. Got it. I got it. The, rest, the estimated residual standard deviation, which I guess is your population, is what you're calling as your population parameter here, correct? The residual yeah. standard, uh, standard deviation, residual standard deviation. Yeah, um, estimated residual standard deviation. Residual standard deviation. Yeah. When, that when, is uh, the line model predicts the election outcome to be yeah. within. Yeah, so, so 
any prediction is within 3.9 percentage points. So if we say that we would predict that in uh, McCain versus Obama, that, um, that we could say that it could be almost four percentage points higher or lower for, uh, the, for McCain to win or lose, which he did lose. Um, but, yes. you know, because he's got no charisma. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've, I've never really heard McCain talk, but I've heard Barack Obama talk. <laughs> yeah, well, but I mean, McCain had a lot of. I mean, I'm not saying Obama didn't have character, but McCain was was very genuine. I thought, like you know, the things he's done for the country and everything. Like, you know, well, in Obama's book, he's very positive about McCain, um, which is quite nice to see that political opponents can get on and have agreements and disagreements, but well, I mean, like, very amicable. But I, 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 I felt like Obama was so wrong in so many ways. So I, I, this may not be a good discussion for now. But I think Obama was the master of really choosing his words well and really like saying it very, very, very politically correctly. And a lot of times his action didn't match those words. So I, I think he was a very skilled orator, but he didn't necessarily... <laughs> certainly was. His actions did not necessarily match his uh, his words. I felt, I mean, like a lot of things. But anyway, that 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 is uh, probably yeah. not something that either of us is going. He is held a bit on a pedestal, considering he his record. His record is not that amazing. But anyway, yes. let's not get into that. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly, because that I'm, that's going to be like a rabbit hole. So as I'm in England, I'm politically neutral. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Okay, so the linear model predicts the election outcome to within 3.9 percentage points. So what does that mean within? Like, what do you mean by, what, what, is, what do you understand it as when you hear within about 3.9 percentage points? Basically, it means that there is an 8% potential variation in the actual result. 4% one way, 4% the other way. Roughly speaking, I'm I'm being over the top when I say four percent, oh. but you know three point you know three three point nine percent, yeah, yeah. So one standard error or one standard deviation of that would be um, one standard deviation of that would be your sixty eight percent of your outcomes should. Yes. So when you see Nate Silver making predictions about elections and saying what yeah. the likelihood of winning is. He's basically basing it on the distribution curve and saying, well, in you know, actually he gets to that uh, when it starts the likelihood, with yeah. Russia, because Clinton yeah. did win the popular vote. By, I, I swear to God, I got so confused. I, I, I mean, I really think that we should stop this at the midway point because I think that's going to be a whole new, the whole separate discussion. But that likelihood really confused me like crazy. But yeah, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but anyway, so I see what you're saying. So it is 4.4% 4 this way, 4% this way. So the linear model yields a prediction of y is equal to 46.6. Okay, because of uh, or in the popular world in the incumbent party. Okay, so that's fine. And then you can actually fit your regression line and then you can use the model to make predictions. And so here I am completely lost. So the 72% chance of a Clinton victory Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm on page ninety six right now. So okay. where are we? Okay, here we go. Here's yeah. the picture here. Yeah. So um, hers, Clinton's folk. I'm sorry, not her. Yeah, wait. Uh, yeah. What was Clinton's forecast vote percentage? The linear model predicted forty six point three, and the growth at that time was two percent. So therefore, yes. it's plus three times two, which is fifty two point three, which is more than fifty percent. So the 7.3 7 shows the probability distribution of this work. So it's one thing to make a prediction of what percentage of votes they'll get. The, but it's another thing to have a probability distribution of this forecast. What does that mean? What is the difference between a probability distribution of the forecast and to say, so you see how it says this forecast what percentage does not allow alone tell you how likely, so this is your likelihood, 
that Clinton could win the popular vote. We also need some assessment of the uncertainty in the predictions. So is that is that getting into your confidence intervals of the prediction or, I mean, isn't that what we just did earlier where we said the standard deviation was, since the standard deviation of the model was 3.9, we said it's 3.9 one way or the other, um, and then plus or minus would, uh, 3.9 would fit 68%, and twice that would fit 95% um, of that. So like 8% in either direction would be um, two standard deviations or 95% of your entire thing, no, correct? 8% variance from the mean in terms of um, both looking at both sides. It's actually, it was 3.9% on either side, so. But that's one standard deviation. But that's one standard deviation, that's 68, that's at 68 So if it is 95%? 95% confidence interval would be twice that. So, so that would be about 16. So eight, yeah. almost 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 eight percent either way. That's what I so, mean. Yeah. yeah. So when you look at it down here, um, if you look at the bit between below figure two point three, it gives the point forecast of forty six point three. Yes. Plus two times, yeah. um, because there was two because there was a growth of two. The growth of two. Yeah. 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 No, but I'm expected not, I, I want to know what is the difference between. Um, so, okay, hold on. Um, the forecast vote percentage, okay, does not tell you how likely it is that she would win the popular vote. So you need some assessment of the uncertainty. So let's look at figure 7.3. You have the yeah. probability distribution of the forecast, which is 52.3, like we, like, uh, we talk. Uh, and then a standard deviation of 3.9, right? In constructing the regression model, we are assuming a normal approximation of the errors which is mean zero and again, a standard deviation of 3.9. So one okay. of the things it does, it, if you look here uh, at the graph, one of the things it doesn't show you in the graph is exactly where the um, prediction is, but the prediction is in, the, can you see my cursor? The prediction... I can't even see your screen. Are you sharing anything? Oh, wait. Uh, oh, I'm sharing, uh, 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 what's it? Uh, right, okay. So, yeah. So can you see my cursor now? Uh, I can. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can annotate this. Right. So that is our prediction line. Yes. And that here is the point of winning. Oh, God. <clears throat> Undo. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, let's draw a different color and also do it in a thicker oh, line. Huge. Right. So this is a point. Oh, God, that's too thick. <laughs> right. Anyway, ignore that. This is the point of winning. Yeah. 50%. Correct. Yeah, and this group, this or this is our prediction. So what we can say is, mm -hmm. if we're predicting that Hillary is going to get fifty-two percentage mm -hmm. uh, percent, that means that anything that falls on this side means that she. Hang on, let's go back to a different color. What color is Democrat? Red. Red. Right. No, blue. Is it blue? Yes, blue state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's blue. Yeah, okay. Different yeah. colors from here. Um, right. So anything on this side is Clinton victory, right? Correct. So that's 50. So that means that if we're predicting that Hillary's going to get 52% and you have to get about 50% to win the popular vote. Correct. And then anything on this side of distribution means that she's going to win. Yeah. So that side of the standard deviation means that she wins anyway. So we can say that she's got 50% chance of winning if it goes 50% uh, if it goes outside. Now this side is how much of this overlaps with the 50% mark, and we can say that this bit here, um, this bit here is still um, is still the chance of her winning. So that would be was it 52? So between that percentage is there's another 22%. So that's that's 22 percent 2.3 so 2.3 yeah that bit's 50 percent there and then this last bit here on the other side is where donald trump wins the election so donald trump has at this his this point a chance of what is it 72 so he's got a 38 percent chance of winning the popular vote how did he get 72%? Because, 
because um, your ch- your predicted chance of winning is based on um, the area your, on the curve for that shaded part. Yes, and the bit above fifty percent. So anything that is but above the fifty percent mark is uh, can be yeah. translated. So you can turn those standard deviations values into uh, probability values, right? So, so it, if we're at a standard, de- if if the standard deviation of the mean, sorry, of our prediction is on this is on this side, so long as we're on this side, whatever value that is, Hillary still wins, which means the probability of her winning is based on how much of the distribution is most likely to land in this part. Because okay. if you remember this bit here. So roughly about, where is it? Up to about here is one standard deviation. Uh Yes. Yeah. Uh, And that's one standard deviation. Sorry, I'm still writing Republican (laughs) colours, if if that bothers you. Um, (laughs) No. um, Yeah, there we go. So there's one SD. Uh, I'm not very good at drawing with mouse. Anyway. The point, the point, I've made a lot, massive mess of this, but the point is, is the one SD is um, 68% of the vote, which makes, means that you capture that amount of data, but you can translate your percentage of vote share based on the Gaussian distribution into a probability of winning, which is why, and the reason why you do this, rather than saying she's going to win, uh, um, is because like say Nate Silver converts this into uh, one in uh, one in one in like a one in no uh, what was it a two in three chance, which means that in a, there's a one in three chance for Trump to win. I see. That's the wrong way to do that last part. Um, yeah, but the the point is is that um, is that you can use the you can use the Gaussian distribution. And if you know the uh, if you know the curvature of your distribution, in order to predict the probability that Clinton's victory will be above fifty two percent, and then you can predict out the chance. So the way that he does it here, right? How do I get rid of all this? Uh, right, clear. Build words. How does he do that here? Yeah. So he creates robust T. I. Oh, so this is our data. I don't know what this is. Fixed effect. Oh, right. He's picking out the bits from the model. Oh, I think the fixed ones are the ones which can be explained by your model, but the the, the variable ones are the is your error term. Like so yeah. I don't like how he uses points. Oh, he does it yeah. for chapter, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because uh, he's got model up here. Yes. which is called M7.1B. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Correct. And then M7.1, what's M7.1 then? 1.1, yeah. Anyway, he, he's calculated, uh, what's it, Clinton's chance of winning there. And then what he does is uh, calculate two sides of the standard deviations and creates the residuals. Big chance of winning. X is 51. Oh. (laughs) Really hard. Yeah, it's not easy, is it? Yeah. Because coding is quite good for this. Yeah. So let's look at that formula, one minus P norm, 50 comma, 52.3 comma, 3.9, okay. So oh yeah, that, that, so that, that's it, that's how he's got it. So, so got that from distribution. Uh, so why is it one minus? Uh, if you think of 50 as yeah. this, as saying that's the center point. Correct. Um, and then your mean is mu, so, so, the mean is the the mean is you from your prediction instead, so that's this bit down the middle, and then the SD is the sigma, which is used to create this. 
So I guess that bit. Why is it one minus though? Let's have a quick look at what happens if I just do P, P norm 50. mean equals zero e equals one all right never mind ignore that <laughs> oh no it's fine um i think you kind of jumped ahead though because we are still at um oh, okay so. sorry Where are we? So ours is still figure 7.3. Yeah. Um, probability of probability distribution is 52.3 with a strong deviation of 3.9. We're assuming a normal approximation for the errors, which is conventional. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, we, are very we are very slightly understating uncertainty here by considering the fitted parameters. Um, which, uh, to estimate the probability. She wins if her wolf share exceeds 50%, and this is the shaded area in the model. It's between 40% and 60%. And we can assist Gosh, this is. <laughs> Not quite sure why it's minus one minus though. Oh, it says down here, doesn't it? Uh, Vote share estimate. So total area under the curve. The total area under the cu curve is one. So one is just basically like we're yeah. taking. Yeah, is like the whole population. And then it says down here what it says down here. Um, uh, P norm is fifty. Um, 52.3 and then 3.79, which is the values that he plugs into there. Not really sure quite what the 50 represents in that case. Yeah. And also, I don't understand why the range is between 40 and 65. Um... Oh, it's just because that's like the most. Um, it's just because I think that's just the range that they've chosen okay. because that's the most likely scores within three de standard deviations. So if you were take, choosing like, you know, two standard deviations covers 95%, three standard de deviation yeah. covers uh, whatever. So that, those are the numbers that you get to a maximum of away from the uh, predicted value. Yeah. In the event, Clinton received 51.1% of the popular vote well within the forecast distribution, but she lost the electoral college, which is decided by which states are won by each candidate. And to forecast the electoral vote winner, you need to predict the vote in each state for which you need a multi-level model, and that's beyond the scope of this. So the reason the, the popular vote is possible is because it's in, across the entire nation, whereas to predict who wins each state has to be has to be modeled at each state level. So I guess it's really hard to model, like, yeah, and I know like both Nate Silver and all the other economists, uh, the groups, they, they try to do that and that was where the complexity was because they were they were doing state by state election uh, forecast forecasting. Yeah, that's a lot easier. To there's post. there's a, there's several factors. So if you look at Nate Silver's thirty five uh, yeah five thirty eight blog five thirty eight that's it. Then one of the things that he also does is he weights the blogs. Yeah. Sorry, not the blogs. The um the uh, the polls based on who's doing it because oh, yeah. some of them oh, are yeah. like political, um, politically affiliated uh, polls that are just designed yeah. to boost their candidate's side, um, yeah. which is, I always think it's a bit weird, but like, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. 
Um, so he gives them a rating, A, B, C, you know, A plus plus or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. That's right. And then I think that is plugged into the model as well. Yeah. Um, but it makes sense as well because obviously you uh, each state functions very differently in the United yeah. States. As I understand it, it's almost like a separate countries. Like yeah, like, like separate countries. Yeah. Yeah. So of course, then you wouldn't go with the popular vote, but the popular vote is still indicative to some extent of what your final electoral of what, yeah, the likely result would be. Yeah. Which is why I guess when you have an upset and the person who wins the popular award doesn't win the electoral college, like it's always like something like, whoa, you know. Well, we always hear that over here too, which is, you know, uh, people yeah. go, oh, well, we didn't win the uh, popular vote, but it's kind of like popular. each county in the UK, they don't act as separate countries, but yeah. it's quite important because the needs of people in cities is quite different to the needs of people in the countryside. True. That's correct. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess it kind of makes sense. If 50 is the place which is your center and you want to know what's falling on the other side, you do want to do a one minus that. Yeah. Okay. I guess so. Okay. I guess, I, guess, I guess the only way really is to practice with some other data and just see what happens with the probability. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, um, so, well, any, shall we shall we move on to the next section? Because this is all about um, fitting models and then yeah. uh, creating comparison data. Yeah, and actually, I really like that part. I don't know if I'll get through all of it since I. Okay. Anyway, checking the model fitting procedure using fake data. So here, obviously, they're getting back to simulation. They are going mm -hmm. with their old. I mean, since they already have the intercept and the coefficient, they are they're already using that. Um, and then um, uh, also they have the measure at the actual experimental or so-called um, um, observed data, which is your Hibbs uh, dollar growth. And then they are simulating it against, um, uh, simulating the fake data using A plus B times X, which is what they, uh, what was, uh, what, what, which is what they started with. And then of course they are using, using um, their error term, which is uh, mean cent uh, zero centered at the mean and, and then sigma, which we know was 3.9. So, and now they're going to plot your Y and your uh, X. So is X your, wait, what is X? Okay, yeah, so X is what was observed. Y is what was um, simulated. So, and, and they're gonna put it on a scatter plot presumably. So, the here the the deviation standard deviation was four, and it they appear to have gotten um, the intercept and slope to be pretty close to uh, what they had actually seen on their model. And here they're going to look at um, sixty eight percent and um, b minus b hat b minus b hat. So like, uh, True value of B falls within B minus B hat of uh, uh, standard error 68. Um, let's see. So, how did they get B minus B underscore hat? What is B there? Is that just like your B? Which? Um, one second. Absolute value of B. We can then check if the true value of B. Uh, okay, so they, 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 they figure out the true value of B using the coefficient, uh, uh, the, which is the slope of B, and they're trying to determine if that falls within the 68 and 98, 95% confidence intervals. So you can do that for each coefficient, is that right? Right, yeah, you can, okay, that's correct. So yeah, yeah. B minus B hat. Uh, and oh, so, do so what they're doing here is they're taking the coefficients of the model and yeah. then they, they're recreating them uh, through simulation. So what they got here was 3.2, but what they had was 3.0. So it's going to be three minus, um, uh, it's going to be three minus 3.2, right? Because it's, and it's an absolute value, obviously. So it'll 0 0.2 um, and, 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 and then they're gonna look at the 68%. If the true value falls within the true. 
so what is the out result of that? <laughs> I just realized that you already got this thing left in. Okay. Tibble, and then can you go down uh, a little bit more, August? Okay. Uh, okay. So here we go back to that same four chains, yada, yada, which we saw with um, BRM. Um, is there any reason why someone would use BRMS versus STAN or STAN GLM? If, uh, I think our STAN pretty much does what BRMS does, right? So why would anyone... Um, I think BRM gives... Um, well, it seems to give a lot more on the output. Lot more information. Okay, yeah, I think that is correct. Okay. Okay, so um, if you look at the, uh, the book on page 98, they generate the 68% um, the and the 95%. Yes. Uh, and I want to know what that output of that thing is. The cap based 68% coverage, do you know what that is? The 68% coverage? That's just yeah. one standard deviation. Yeah, yeah. But where, are you seeing that here anywhere? Um, does he use that here? Uh, um, due to simulation variance, our results are a little different to those texts, but they're pretty close. To, most of the data. Move, okay. at least, yeah. Yeah. Uh, data are composed of only 16 cases after all. Oh, yeah, that is a big problem. Oh, yeah, here we go. So hit, hit, we get onto this bit here. Okay. Uh, so and that's your B hat. That, yes. So B hat is your average beta value, is your mean beta value. And BSE is your standard error. Um, uh, so, what's the yeah. difference between B and B hat? So within that's 3.2 what... and uh, it's 3.2 and 3, right? Because that's what they get on their model. Exactly, and yeah. So that's 0 0.2, which is less than, is that less than one standard error? Yeah, so the, um, the question, yes, yeah, so the question is, is was it, uh, so what they've done is taken the absolute value of B minus B hat. And one and then, standard error would be what, 3.9? So is right? it greater than one standard error? Um, oh, that's 0 0.7, sorry. I think the... Yeah. Yeah, so, that nope. is. Yeah, so as it says, nope, it was more than one standard deviation away, which is like saying it was outside the 98% confidence in tool. Okay, wait, I'm confused. How? Because 3.3, 3 minus 3.2 is 0 0.2, while your standard error was 0 0.7. So um, I think it's because in this particular case, ah, when Sigma they ran the simulation, is, it was larger. Yeah, the, the when they're simulating, it's much larger. Well, no, actually, that's the sigma for the for the population. If you look at X, your standard yeah. error was zero point nine two. Look at that. Your oh 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 yes, right. So so the point here is because this is the fake data, right? Correct. And they're comparing it to this data. Yeah, yeah. so it's 3, three minus um, 3.2 or something like that. So honest. B is 3. Yes. And B hat, which is here. Yeah, B hat is Which is uh, the estimate from the fake model. The fake model. So yes. B hat is uh, this one. Is that right? Yes. Oh. No. Yes, no, that's right. So three minus one point nine two, which is definitely more than zero point seven. Yeah, which is more than zero point seven. Therefore, the uh -huh. very there, therefore the standard error is considerably different between the two models. So it's fallen outside the sixty eight percent confidence interval. But it is within two standard deviations. Yeah. Uh, so what does that mean? If which means that it's within 95% confidence interval the posterior mean, but it's not within the 68% confidence interval. So why did you call it the posterior mean? Sorry? Why did you call it the posterior mean? Um, uh, did I? Yeah, you said posterior mean. So I was wondering why you use the word posterior mean and not just mean. Um, That's more of a Bayesian thing, so I don't know why you had used posterior mean. Oh, um, if we say the posterior mean and the MADEC from the oh, so then that. we can formally assess how close they are. That. So the posterior is uh, the data that you have after simulation, isn't it? Aha, uh -huh, got it. Okay. Well, actually, it's August. I'm going to have to go now because I have to go yeah, to the no office. Yeah, no worries. I, I, we can pick this up next week. So I think we'll have to pick up from uh, seven, step four, emb embedding the simulation in a loop. Okay, cool. Okay, 
hey, um, sorry that I had to leave early, but I still think this was super helpful. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, no, it's, it certainly helps to talk through this because I don't really understand yeah. this bit that well either myself. Well, really appreciate it and see you next week. I'll, yeah, absolutely. I'll pick up the rest of it. Hopefully I can knit it by then. Yeah. No, oh, no worries. I, I mean, I can send you I can send you what I've got. It's probably the same. Yeah. No, I need yeah. to kind of troubleshoot that and see what's going on. So I can know that. Okay, thanks a lot, August. No worries. Thanks, Pavlita. Yeah. Bye.